this is a special day. Today we come and we celebrate 200 years of God's faithfulness to us. We come together with the words of Psalm 118 upon our lips. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Church. For those that don't know me, I'm Adam Colstrom. I'm the current pastor of Chestnut Street Baptist, but we are joined today by many of the former pastors that have served here. We are joined today by many old friends, by many familiar faces, many that have moved away and have come back to be with us for this celebration. For God has been good. He has shown his love and his faithfulness to us. And we give him the thanks this morning. I'd like to begin by recognizing our old friends. I would like to take a moment and just ask, just briefly, if you are a friend from long ago or a friend from far away that has come back specially to be with us this morning, could you just take a moment to stand so that we can recognize you? And thank you for joining us. I'm not going to single out the people out here that I saw didn't stand. <laughs> but there are more of you out there. I would also like to thank and I would like to recognize today we have two guest musicians. Sybil Clement Wentworth is the pianist today. She grew up here at Chestnut Street Baptist, served as the organist and choir director in the 60s from the age of 11 to 18. And then she left for college. We're glad to have her here today. We're also... We're also glad to have Margaret Stanley Small playing the organ today. She served as organist and choir director in the 70s here. And we're glad to have her do the concert at the beginning of today's service. So thank you. And right now, I would like to invite former pastor Michael Elliott to come forward. He would like to give a word of greeting to you, the congregation. Well, it's nice to be back with you this morning and to see so many old friends. And I met some new people as I came in today. I bring you greetings, and in just a moment I'm going to read you a letter from our church, from the Board of Elders to Chestnut Street Baptist Church. But just a little, I asked Pastor Adam if I could just say a few words now and get the hellos out of the way so that when it comes time for me to preach, I can just get up and do that. And wanted to thank you so much, number one, for inviting me and my family here to come to this auspicious uh, event, the 200th anniversary of Chestnut Street Baptist Church. When I was pastoring here, Every week I would walk, one time during the week, I would walk up those steps and I would see the sign that says 1808. And I thought, am I going to live that long? Am I, are they going to keep me around here that long? And I can be a part of that. And then came the time when we had to leave Camden. John Walsh started showing my picture on America's Most Wanted and I thought I needed to get out of town. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I appreciate I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> Actually, we were called to a, a church in uh, Pontiac, Michigan, and we've been there uh, 11 and a half years now. And, uh, but we missed you so much. And when, uh, often on that, that woman and I, when, when we were talking on the phone, she'd say, you know, we've got to have you come back. I said, oh, I'd love to come back. And then I got a letter from Wayne on the board saying, we'd love to have you come back. And it was last fall, and uh, then I had my neck surgery in December, and, uh, and then I had the, the cancer surgery in in April. You know, things really went downhill. I, got, I, got, I, got, I was healthy! No, I'm telling you, I just thought, I told Rob and I said, you know, when I was up in the hospital for a week, I thought that we got to call him and tell him to get somebody else. And I just don't think I'm going to make it. So I appreciate the Lord being so kind and allowing me the strength to be back here with you. And people have just been so kind. Uh, the, the committee, bicentennial committee, Pastor Ed, everyone has been over backwards to welcome us and make us feel comfortable. The Johnsons have been over backwards just to make us feel comfortable at their place. And uh, it's just a great joy. Uh, some of you I won't see after us because you have other other things to do, but we hope that we'll be able to run into you sometime in the next few days. We'll be here until uh, Thursday morning and then head back. But thank you so much for the invite. This is, this is, this is the, the only other event that means more to me than coming to speak here was when I was invited 
to speak in front of the president of the United Shirt Company. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm so sorry, please. I have a letter from the Board of Elders at Maryland Community Church. It says, Dear Pastor Holstrom and members of Chestnut Street Baptist Church, Greetings on behalf of Maryland Community Church. We rejoice with you on the wonderful occasion of your 200th anniversary and trust that the events that have been planned to commemorate this occasion would bring joy and encouragement to you and your community and even beyond. Very few churches in our nation can claim 200 years of continuous ministry, and it is our prayer that by God's grace your light will shine for many generations on, both in Camden and throughout the whole world. We trust your efforts on behalf of the Samaritan Purse would meet and even exceed the goal that you have set as you seek to comfort the hurting people of the world. We pray that your new pastor, Adam Colstrom, will be blessed and strengthened in his ministry as he faithfully teaches God's word each week and that the body of Christ there in Camden would rejoice to see the teaching of God's word produce more fruit in the lives of believers. Thank you for the encouragement of your faithful testimony, even to the followers of Christ here in Pontiac, Michigan. May your time of celebration be filled with joy and gratitude because of God's sustaining grace. In His grace and His glory, the elders of Maribel Community Church, Michael Elliott, Pastor Michael Elliott, Pastor Barry Ruff, David Bundy, Joseph Pyle, and Steve Holtzclaw. We have a number of our members of our church that have sent you uh, cards that we're going to give to Pastor Colstrom and give us a letter of encouragement and anniversary to Pastor Colstrom right now. And again, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, part of this anniversary. Here I am trying so hard to set a solemn tone on <laughs> such an important occasion, and I'm practicing such restraint. <laughs> All for naught. Thank you. We have some other letters of encouragement that we have received, and you can see them posted downstairs in the fellowship hall during our fellowship luncheon together. We've received uh, written communications for this occasion from President George W. Bush, Governor John E. Baldacci, the Office of Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, and the Office of Senator Olympia Snow. You can see those letters again posted down in the fellowship hall, so be sure to take the time to look at those. Now I'm going to turn it over to our Bicentennial Committee for a very special Bicentennial Minute. On the occasion of this, our 200th birthday celebration, the Bicentennial Committee under the authority of the Board of Trustees, commissioned Carol Siebel to paint a picture of our church. While Carol is a well-known local artist, her work has been selected for many jury shows and is exhibited in galleries throughout the eastern United States and the Caribbean. Numerous private and corporate collections both in America and abroad, also include her work. Now, I think Carol's here with us today, so if she is, I'd like to have her stand. Renew them again 
in our day, Lord. Let's stand and sing and worship and praise as we remember what he has done and pray that he'll do it again.
occasion of our 200th anniversary, we remember how great is our God. We invite those here and we invite those in the community to sing with us, joining his praises. For 200 years, this church has been founded on one thing, Christ and Christ alone. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, when I was with you, I knew nothing but Christ and him crucified. That your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on the power of God. We will celebrate the power of the cross for 200 years we have, and for 200 years into the future we ever will. For it was Christ and on him alone that our hope rests, from whom our power comes and with whom our future lies.
Lord, we stand forgiven today at the cross. For 200 years, Lord, this church has been founded upon the cross of Christ and the cross alone. And Father, we give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you for every day in the future that you would give us. And Lord, we pledge that there will be no other message upon our lips. Lord, the songs we sing may change. The language we use, the pastors that serve, the people we see up front may change. But Father, the cross will never change. The cross is our only hope from eternity past into eternity future. So Father God, we pray that you would use us in this community, that we might invite everyone that we see to sing with us, how great is our God. How great is our God that he might give us his only son to die for us, that we might be forgiven. Lord, you've done great things. Do them again. Renew your works in our day by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated.
up here on quite a workout. <laughs> Father, we've read a few requests today, but we come confident. Confident because we know that you know us. Confident because we know that you know every need upon our heart and in our lives. You know everything before it's even formed upon our lips. So we give you thanks. We give you praise. And we lay before you these requests, confident that you will hear them. Lord, I pray for this church. I thank you so much for that which you have done. But God, I eagerly anticipate that which you will yet do. For Lord, we truly have a future greater than our memories. We truly look forward today with great joy and excitement as we are confident, Lord, that you have brought us this far and you will lead us home. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us, your people, to seek you with all of our hearts, to put aside other things that might distract us, to give ourselves wholly and completely to you and to your service, that we might be used to go into all of the world and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that you command them. And Lord, we know that as you have been for the first 200 years, that you will surely be with us always to the very end of the age. So we give ourselves into your care. We give ourselves for your power, leading, and direction. We give ourselves for your service and your glory that you might use us to bring this entire community together, to sing in one voice how great, how great is our God. Amen. Let's stand and sing together hymn number 521, Redeemed. Please stand and join me.
before Reverend Elliott comes to share with us, I invite our kindergartners through fourth graders, you may be dismissed to a children's program out through this door over here. So kindergartners through fourth grade. Jesus Christ, that we can get to heaven through our works. That is discouraging. 
That is heartbreaking. And so what I want to give you today, believe it or not, from the Apostle Peter, are six principles that can help us so that in our generation, our time here at Chestnut Street, in my time at Maryland, that we will continue this legacy that our spiritual forefathers and mothers left to us to, as a stewardship. So what's the key word? The key word for spiritual success at Chestnut Street Baptist Church. The, the key word, the key word is passion. P-A-S-S-I-O-N, passion. If you or I were to go to the Himalayan Mountain Climbing Institute at Darjeeling, India, which, by the way, is the home of the world's most famous tea, but also right near Mount Everest, you and I would encounter a museum that has much evidence of raw passion. We would, as we were going through, we would see maps. We would see gloves. We would see sometimes flashlights and ice picks and axes. But also, the most significant thing that we would see is we would see one pair of shoes. People have that too, but that guy was my age. And every inch of his body, from his wrist on up, and from his thighs all down, were covered with tattoos, centering around characters from Walt Disney. <laughs> Any of you ever seen that? He had Ariel, the mermaid, he had Donald, he had Mickey. In fact, they, he took a tour of his whole house. His whole house was just a miniature Disneyland. That's misguided. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> but it cost him everything. It cost him his family. His family doesn't speak to him. His third wife left him. So I want to speak to you about passion, today, spiritual passion. Now, passion is one of those words that are, are better described than defined. You see, passion answers the question, what do I love enough to die for? What a person is willing to die for is that what he or she is living for, which is the passion of his or her life. Some of you would voluntarily say, my passion are my grandkids. My passion are my kids. My passion, are, my passion is my spouse. My passion is my job. Passion is my hobby. But the question we want to entertain today for the future spiritual commitment of because you have a passion for God. The key for spiritual success, for spiritual existence at Chestnut Street Baptist Church is a passion for God. Yes, the building can still exist because of wonderful things. Harry showed me the lights and the, the sound that you have worked on and other things. The building could exist for another hundred years. You can still have church at the end of Chestnut Street Baptist on the side. Somebody in the future would have a 300, 308th celebration. But would this, would this be a New Testament church? Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Will Chestnut Street Baptist Church, will Maryland Community Church, continue to be a spiritual church? Because you can have a church, you can be a church, and not have a spiritual church. And this goes back to our outline. To have a church that's spiritual, you and I will need to understand and prize who God is and then have a passion for the things that honor God. And I've been in ministry 33 years. I've been around the bars many times. And despite the fact that we have Bible college, Bible seminary, but Bible computer. We, we, have, we have so many things for the Bible today, but even though the church is a illiterate church when it comes to God, we, we don't allow God to, to be superficial and to get us in a lot of trouble, but we don't know enough about God to be satisfied enough to make sure that the legacy of Chestnut Street Baptist Church will continue on. Even the Apostle Paul knew this in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are, remember the next word? 
spiritual. Why do you say spiritual? Because in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, he said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, pain, and the ninth. The fruit of the Spirit, the ninth fruit of the Spirit is just modeling Christ. Christ exemplifies all the whole thing. So we want to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Just select the verses from this passage. 2 Peter is two of it's the second of two letters that Peter wrote. Let me give you just a little context about 1st and 2nd Peter. It was written at a time when the church was hurting. In 1st Peter, which was written between 62 and 64 AD, they were, trials were there. They were going through trials. But by the time 2nd Peter, what we're going to look at for today, came, trials were overwhelming them. It was 30 plus years since the church had gone from Acts chapter 2 where they were well received now being well persecuted. They were uber persecuted completely. Their emperor was Nero. Nero, according to history, burned Rome and he needed a scapegoat, so he said, let's blame the Christians and many Christians who Peter were writing to were coming back. I mean, you couldn't call it a funeral. How could you have a funeral service for a loved one that was burned on a tree? Burned to death on a tree. It was severe persecution. They were losing everything. They were losing their homes. They were losing their finances. They were losing their friends. They were losing their lives. It was a terrible time to be a Christian. Not only that, false teaching, believe it or not, in, within 30 years, false teaching had, had been so prevalent that in 2 in Peter, the whole, second Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter is dedicated to exposing false teaching. There is only one positive 10 word sentence in 2 Peter chapter 2 that is, that is not ranting and, uh, about false teachers and, and what they're like. So they needed hope. So hope was going to come in the form, in the person of that great and mighty theological hero, the Apostle Paul. That's who we would have wanted. We would have wanted Paul. Paul so studious, Paul so smart, Paul so practical. But God didn't send Paul. The one who Paul, the one who the Lord sent was the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. <laughs> the arrogant, boastful, fearful Simon Peter. I call, I call him Simon Rock. So that has the title. Give us Paul. Please give us John. Please give us James. Give us Jude. Give us Apollos. Give us Barnabas. Give us Tisicus. Give us Epaphroditus. Give us anyone but Peter. And I can understand your reticence. Because he was full of fear. When he said, if you're really the Son of God on the, on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, let me walk on water. He walks on water. He looks at Jesus. And then he looks at the wind and the waves. And he sings. But remember what Jesus said to him? He didn't say, hey, Peter, I got your back. Hey, Peter, don't worry. In a couple, you right now, but in a couple chapters, you're going to say some neat things about me. <laughs> he said, you, of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he did say something incredible about Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, no, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be crucified there. But I'm going to rise again on the third day. No one said it again. So Peter, full of fear, thought he had to say something. He said, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You know what happened next? Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man, you're man sinners. You're not God's interest. Into an apex in Matthew 27 where he denied the word three times because he was full of Peter. So we're going to see in this chapter Things. Some of them are going to spend a lot of time, and then I'll just spend a few moments on a couple of them. We're going to see that what we need with Peter had, because he was writing to a church that needed help and hope, and we need that today. Our Christian liberties are being taken away from us, it's so factor. And we are starting to hear the rumblings of persecution. So, what is said by Peter today are things we really need to know. First of all, to have a passion for God. I mean, to, to have a passion so that this, the, the next generation will 
the uh, spiritual here at Chester Street Baptist Church. We need to have a passion for the doctrine of salvation. You and I need to have a passion for the doctrine of salvation. I heard that in the voice of Adam as he was praying, as he was leading you in worship. He was expressing to you, the choir was expressing to you, and the music we sang was expressing a passion for the gospel. Because the gospel is the only thing that's going to change people today. I don't know who your favorite candidate is, but I'm telling you, either one of them are going to make a change that Jesus is going to make one day. And we need to have a passion for the doctrine of salvation. Where do you find that? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, he writes, a bond servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here's the phrase. I'm using the numerical standard Bible. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, God the Father. No. Jesus Christ. This is a, I was thinking about this last night. This is a strange way to open a letter. Adam was emailing me this week, and Lynn has been emailing Robin, and none of all these exchanges that we talk about the doctrine of salvation right at the beginning. In every single New Testament epistle, we have the apostles begin by talking about to those who are saved. They have passion <coughs> for the gospel. Again, we have to remember the context. The context is that they are under severe persecution, and this is the first thing that comes out of Simon Rock's mouth. Is that I'm writing to those. I'm not even writing to all the believers who are hanging. I'm not even writing to all the people who are hanging with you. I'm writing to those who have received the same kind of faith as ours that comes from the righteousness of Christ. Same way with Peter. Would you go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1? Same, same thing here. This is an unbelievable way, but it shows what they needed. They needed this so bad, just like we need it for today. Again, Simon Peter starts it off by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to take your pen. And I want you to put a number one next to the word chosen. Or the NIV says God's elect. Put a number one there. Then I want you to put a, a number two next to the word scattered. Then I want you to go verse number two and put a number three next to according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The reason I'm having you do that is because there are very few translations of the Bible that translate this in a way that accurately tell the truth. So let me read it. Starting with Simon Peter, and then I'm going to read it how the way it is in the Greek. I, I, I'm altering one word. I'm, I'm leaving out the word alien because, I, because of time's sake. And I'm going to read it by doing the introduction, but then I want you to drop down one, two, and three when I get there. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are who are, are chosen, scattered according to the foreknowledge of God. That is a That's what they needed to hear, folks. They needed to know that they were chosen and scattered according to the foreknowledge of God, because they were under severe uh, persecution, physically, physically, financially, and emotionally. And when Peter said to this, said them to this, said to them in this order in the Greek language. This would bring healing and encouragement to these hurting believers. You see, by putting it in the way that Peter actually said it, it explains to them the main reason why they were rejected by the world. They were rejected by the world because they were chosen by God. They were also scattered. They were also persecuted according to the foreknowledge of God. Which means that their salvation and their suffering wasn't random. It wasn't by chance. It wasn't punishment. But it was all according to the plan of God. Now think about the world. Does the world have that assurance? What is the world asking? The world is asking, where am I going? I don't know if I have to do this and do that to get to heaven. What am I to do to get to heaven? Is it every road will lead to heaven? Where, where am I going? And why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering financially? Why am I suffering physically? Why am I suffering emotionally? The world doesn't have answers, but we do. Because we have chosen, scattered every aspect of our life under the sovereignty of God according to the plan of God. And that's what they needed. They needed hope. Peter doesn't talk to them about psychology. He doesn't try to boost up their self-esteem. 
He didn't say, all right, what you need to do now, folks, is that you need first to do, you need to pray the prayer of Jabez. Uh, you need chicken soup for your soul. You need to get your best life right now. Their best life right now is that they were dying. They needed hope. And the hope they found was in God. <coughs> the only problem is, how, how do you get to God? Because the Bible says, all that sin is well, short of the glory of God. The book of Ephesians says that we are without hope, without God. We're that separated. You're in 1 Peter, go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. Peter, this is why I fall in love with it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. For Christ died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust. Why? There it is. That he might bring us to God. We have a hope. Even in our suffering. I, I did not wake up in March rejoicing in the Lord that I had a five-inch tumor on my sternum. But I could see that God was using that to refine me, to help me to trust Him more, even in our suffering. And all that comes about all because of what Jesus has done for us. That's why Peter said in Acts chapter 4, there is salvation in <coughs> no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be Saved. What did Peter do? Acts chapter 2, 3,000 came to Christ. In Acts chapter 10, he came in screaming and kicking, sharing the gospel with the Gentile. Then in Acts chapter 11, when, when the Jewish church got together for a, you know, what are we going to do with the Gentiles? We don't want the Gentiles hanging around us. The apostle Peter said this in Acts 11, 17. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in the way of God? You see, Peter had a passion for the subject of theology. Let's go back to our text. Peter says, I am writing to those that received the same kind of faith as our. We have the same exact salvation that the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, every Christian that's ever lived the same, 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 the same way. Simon Peter is no more saved than we are. He's not going to live in eternity a, a million years longer than we are. We have the same exact salvation. You see this was their greatest thing because their families were dying. False teaching was prevalent. They had no money. They had no discretionary fund. They had now no friends. The church was going underground. They had no hope other than their relationship with God and their salvation that brought them to God. The main point is this. Biblical Christianity will not continue at Chestnut Street Baptist Church or Maryland Community Church in the future unless you have a passion for the doctrine of salvation. And you know what? The moment I finish this point, you know who the first person I thought of who, who had a passion for salvation? It was Kilton Crabtree. He had a passion for the gospel. I was so blessed. It's 20 years ago when I started coming down here and, work, and uh, meeting with the public committee. I'm so grateful for the men of Chestnut Street, Noel Oaks, Bob Wichelbeck, Sam Pendleton, Morris Case. I mean, I don't, I don't want to forget anybody. The men who shaped me, the men who mentored me, the men, the men who worked with me here. But, but Kilton was special because he wasn't even overbearing. He loved the Lord. I cannot remember. I cannot ever, 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 never, ever, never remember a conversation with Kilton where it didn't come around the Lord. And he wasn't overbearing. He was a natural part of his life. And beloved, that's what my church needs in this book. A passion for the gospel. Not, we're, we're to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The message of the gospel is to be offensive. We're not to be offensive. We're not to be offensive with our, with our actions, our attitudes, and our appetites. But if we want the next generation, we need to have a passion for salvation. Second, we need to have a passion to be filled with the Spirit of God. We need to have a passion to be filled with the Spirit of God. Look at the very first two words of 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, this, is, this is why it's taking so long to get through this book. The book starts off by saying, Simon, Peter, 
So I had to do some background work on this guy. And we, in the gospel, he's a mess. He's pushy. He's arrogant. He's full of fear. But as I begin to study second, first, first and second Peter together, I begin to see that this was a different God. Now, what happened to Peter that changed him? Go with me to Acts chapter 2, would you please? Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. Acts chapter 2. It's just going to go around in a few places. We'll stay mostly around first and second Peter. What, what changed him? I mean, he could have stayed in Jerusalem. I mean, he was the guy who, would, at, at the sermon, led, led 3,000 people to Christ. And what changed him? Acts chapter 2, verse number 4. It says this. Oops, I did it. I'm sorry. This, this is the birth of the church. This is the, the time when the Spirit of God comes on people, on, on the disciples. And in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, this is what it says. And they, the disciples, were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's just stop right there. You see that word filled? That's a key word. Play in the Greek. And when I used to teach this here at Chester Street Baptist Church, I, you know, I'm Mr. Steve, Stephen Spielberg with my special effects. I, I, you know, I took a glass and filled it to the top. You know, that's really top notch special effects. But, but the word Pleiro means more than that. If we were to take, take a bowl and put that cup, and put that glass in and keep pouring, and it's overflowing, that's what happened to the disciples that day. They were filled to the top. They were overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And you know what happens in that church, too? I've mentioned that a number of times already. We have 3,000 people saved, 3,000 people baptized, and 3,000 people joined the church. And he did that, beloved. He did that by doing an exposition of Psalm 16, uh, Acts, uh, of Psalm 110, and Joel chapter 2. He, had, he did not have a choir. He did not have a worship team. He didn't have uh, dim lights. He didn't have skits. He didn't have a Christian comedian to warm up everything. He, he, he didn't have to give away gasoline to get a crowd. He was filled with the Spirit, and then he preached that people were saved. Being filled with the Spirit changed Simon, Rock, and he could change us because the Holy Spirit wants to make us like the Son of God. And we have to have, we have to have a passion for it. And you know, as you, as you, as you look for books on, on, on being filled with the Spirit, you've got so many things out there, you know. Seven, seven steps to be filled with the Spirit. Six steps, of, three steps. You know, it's like one step to be filled with the Spirit. Listen, folks, I'm telling you, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, the first thing you're going to want, want is you're going to have, want to have a passion to do the will of God. You're going to see God in a different way because you're seeing Him because of the great salvation He offers. And when you see that kind of salvation that's working in your life, you want to do the will of God. And because you want to do the will of God, you need some help. And that's where the Word of God comes in. An exposure, feeding ourselves with the Word of God will do, help us to desire to be filled with the Spirit. And then we realize that there's some attitudes and actions and appetites that are in our life that not only make our, our family think we're hypocrites, but it brings grief, grief to the Lord. And so we begin to deal with sin in our life, and then we depend on the Lord, and then He uses us mightily. And that's what the Spirit needs to do. Don't. Don't. Well, we with salvation, the matter of salvation. Don't make Pastor Adam your hitman. Pastor Adam, I have someone I want you to leave Christ. Here's the name. The, the, the songs of the choir song, we're, we're to reach the world. And don't expect Pastor Adam and the deacon to be filled with the Spirit if you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. And that's a moment by moment by moment. He said, and I'll prove it to you. I won't have you turn to it. There were times when Simon Peter was not filled with the Spirit. Galatians chapter 2, he was in the area of Galatia. He was ministering to the Galatians who had come to Christ, the Gentiles who had come to Christ. He had a good time with it. And then he heard that the, Gen uh, the Judaizers were coming. The Judaizers, the scholarly ones, the, the unique ones who everyone's writing about. Peter was not filled with the Spirit, he was filled with fear. And he ignored the Gentiles who were saved and hanging around the Judaizers. The Judaizers were teaching. You're saved by grace plus circumcision. Like today, you're, we're saved by grace plus baptism. Or we're saved by grace plus the sacrament. And Peter, in the flesh, just like we do, we dishonor the Lord and the Apostle Paul, the new kid on the block, had to confront him face to face. So we, we have this tension all the time of walking in the Spirit. We're walking in the flesh, and that's just what we're going to do. It is a command. The Apostle Paul said, don't be up with language of dissipation, but be filled. Be literally, in the Greek, be continually filled with the Spirit. Don't look for 
seventh plan, just hear the word of God, desire to do the will of God, and depend on Him. Seek, seek in every area of your life, your attitudes, your habits, your actions. You're going to follow Him, and you will be filled with the Spirit. It's going to be a battle because the Apostle Paul also said, walk by the Spirit, so you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So, beloved, if we don't have a passion for the doctrine of salvation, and we don't have a passion to be filled with the Spirit, we will be building the church of the tears rather than the church that's built on the rock of Christ Jesus. Application number three. We need to have a passion for salvation, the Spirit of God. We also have to have, have a passion to be a slave of Christ. This is new. I've not even, worked, I've not even tried this out on our people. I don't know how it's going to work in Peoria either. I didn't <laughs> This is brand new, so I'm testing it out on you. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1. Notice what he says. Simon Peter, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You see the word bond servant? I think the NIV says servant. Really, the word that Peter used and the Lord Jesus used and Paul, all the disciples used was the Greek word doulos. It's used 130 times in the New Testament. So it was not ambiguous to the original hearers that when they were called a doulos, they were not really called a servant, they were really not called a bond servant, they were called a slave. A slave is a person who is literally owned by a master. And though bond slave, is a legitimate translation, or serving can be a legitimate, legitimate translation. It, it really literally means to be a slave. A person without standing, a person without right. And what's so interesting about this is we, we look at Bibles, even going back before the King James Version, even the Geneva Bible would translate this word, doulos, slave, as bond servant or servant, to try to lessen the impact, to sweeten it. And we can understand why, because of the mistreatment of the African American. 17th, 18th, 19th century. Every single translation of the Bible that's out there today, more, more than any other word, will, will not use this word slave. Slave of Christ, that, that's shocking to us. But that's repugnant. But if we really want to have a passion for Christ, we need to be a slave of Christ. Murray Harris from Trinity Evangelical Seminary has written a book called Slave of Christ, a New Testament metaphor for total devotion to Christ. He, I mean, he's a scholarly guy. He's, he's just not a, you know, he's not just looking up in the concordance. This guy is scholarly. And he surveyed 23 major translations of the New Testament and only good speeds, an American, at good speeds of New Testament and American translations use, use the word slave for do But as we look into the New Testament, we see that Jesus used this quite a bit. In Matthew chapter 10, Verse number 24, Jesus said, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. There the NAS translates it slave. It is enough for the teacher that he become like his teacher. It, it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. Okay, I can hear the wheels turning. Brother Elliot, does it, isn't there a verse in the Bible that says, What a friend we have to Jesus? Well, not, not, not quite. I mean, that is a gospel song, and I'm certainly not asking to stand on that song. But, but Jesus did call people friends. But I, I want you to look at the context so we, get, we can really get an understanding. Would you go with me to John chapter 13 first? John chapter 13. I am giving to you things that are just foreign to us. To be a slave of Christ, that just sounds so negative. And my love cup is still when I hear a word like slave. John chapter 13, we're familiar with this passage. It's, it's the passage of Christ. The disciples are upstairs for the Last Supper. Everyone is sitting around because there's no slaves there to wash their feet. Some of them start looking at Peter and say, no way am I washing their feet. Simon Zelot, he's got a knife. He's I'm not washing anybody's feet. Everyone just kept saying, now I'm going to all of a sudden, who, who starts washing their feet? The Lord Jesus. Finally, the disciples took the lesson. Look at John 13, 17. This is not to the whole world he's talking about. Look at 15. For I 
gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, I say to you, a slave, there it is, you also not greater than his master, nor is the one who sent is greater than the one who sent him. Here it is. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Okay, that's good. That's good. He's Lord. They're slave. Now go over to John 14, verse 15. Again, he's preparing himself to die. And he's trying to minister to the disciples who are having a panic at that because he's saying he's leaving them. But he, he's instructed them in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, one more page over. John 15, 14. You are my friends. There it is! There it is! Yay! Well, almost. You are my friends if do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father. I have made known to you. You see, they called him all through the ministry. They called him Lord. Who are you? He's the Lord who commands them. They were to obey. And in fact, obedience, obedience is the most graphic way that we can show that we truly know God and love God and that we're saved by grace because of all that he's done for us, we want, we have that desire to be a slave for him. Obedience is a singular proof that we are a follower of Christ. It is a master-slave relationship. And he, they, he had been calling them slave. Him as their Lord. And that doesn't change despite that in verse 15 he calls them friends as well as slaves. And you study this Every king, every group had, had those who were not in the same category as him. He had friends and who and such he would share in his good. That's what Jesus was doing to us. He shared this to us via the Bible. Let me quote Murray Harris again. It should be observed that although Jesus calls his obedient disciples his friends, they are not thereby authorized to call him their friend. In the Old Testament, Abraham is called God's friend. But this leads James to say not that God was called the friend of Abraham, but that he, Abraham, was called the friend of God, James 2.23. Not that God or Jesus is unfriendly, but each remain a Lord to be obeyed and not a colleague to be the friend. What's the application of this? Is it your time or is it God's time you have? Is it your money or is it God's money? Is it your talent or is it God's talent? Is it your gifts or is it God's gift? Is it your homes or God's homes? Is it your family or is it God's family? Is it your possession or the God's possession? Is it your sex life and who, what you decide to do or is it what God tells us to do? Is it your future or God's future? We're living in a hedonistic world and the Christian, the Christian community and the Christian books are just Line it up behind you. You know how many books you in the Christian bookstore you see that have the pronoun you and your and now. I don't think we really understand this. And the implications are unlimited. People who want to follow Christ Jesus, this will radically change your life because you'll be ready as soon as Pastor Adam or someone here in the body of Christ declares that we need a teacher. And you know you have the gift of teaching, but there's some attitudes and actions in your life that dispel that. In fact, you want to become a member because of the sin in your life. Why aren't you dealing with the sin? Is it your life or God's life? It's a great implication to cut out. And ever, anyone says they're a Christian. Anyone says they're a Christian. But a true Christian is known by following his master. Jesus said if you want to come after He said it in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 to uh, to the disciples and others, in the same way in Luke 9, 23. Anyone wants to come after me, he must, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily. And follow me. We treat each other differently in the body of Christ if we were all slaves of Christ. I, I, I don't have time to go over now, but I'm telling you, you read Matthew chapter 18 really slow, and the implications that are found in Matthew 18. You know, Jesus starts off talking about the little baby. You want everything in the God, you want to become like this little child. You want to be converted. Then he says, if anyone offends one of these, he's switching the metaphor from just a baby. I mean, we can offend a baby by screaming at it. He's changing the metaphor to the Bible. Of course, if anyone offends one of my little ones, it's better than a millstone. We put it around your neck and we toss into a seat. We better be careful on who we talk about and why we're talking about this. Because it's, it's 
It's not our tongue. It's not our trials. It's not our treasures. It's God and we're slaves to Christ. And Jesus exemplified this. Remember what Paul said? He said, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not, re he did not regard the quality with God so that he grasped. In other words, he didn't say, he didn't say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. In Genesis 1, 1, you're mentioned God. In verse number 2, the Holy Spirit's question, I'm not mentioned until, and it's all by implication, until Genesis 1, 26. Why do I have to go to that? Why does the Holy Spirit put out of God? He's going to be exempt. He didn't think calling the God didn't be grasped, but he emptied himself. Taking the form of a, and yes, monster, taking the form of a slave, and being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And you know who helped me do this? I missed this. I, I'm going so fast. If you look at Luke chapter 4, verse number 1, when Jesus was going in to be tempted at the, at the Mount of Temptation, it says he was filled with the Spirit. He, he set the example to be, to be controlled by the Spirit. It's the same word, plagal, that's found in Acts chapter 2. Jesus is our role model for everything. And the Holy Spirit wants to make us all like Christ so that the next generation will continue as we are. The Apostle Paul said, having been freed from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 22 and 23, for he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. It's translated to slave there. You were bought, you were bought with a price. Here it is. Do not become a slave of men. But I'm you're either a slave of Christ or a slave of Satan. Now, these are all sequential. You will understand, you, this is all foreign to you about being a slave to Christ unless you experience salvation. You won't even get anywhere near this unless you understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And then it starts to make sense as we, as we recognize what is stated in the Bible that we are a follow and love Christ in all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our body. Number four. We have a passion for salvation, the Spirit of God, the slave of Christ. And number four, we need to have a passion to grow in a pattern of sanctification. We need to have a passion. Remember the guy who talked about numbers? The guy had a passion about this thing about passion as well. He had a passion to grow in a pattern of sanctification. It's where salvation is instantaneous. Uh, sanctification is a lifelong process where the Spirit of God is forming us to become like Christ. Would you look at verse number 5? We're moving on. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5. Notice what he says. He says, verse number 5, Now for this very reason, that points back to verses 1 to 4, now for this very reason, also, here's the verb, applying all diligence, or applying all passion in your faith. Remember verse 1? I write into those who receive the same kind of faith as ours. In your faith, applying all diligence, I want you to, the NAS translates it, supply. And I didn't like it until I thought about what the word meant. Now, for this very reason, apply all diligence in your faith, supply. Supply comes from a word which means choreogon, where we get the word choreographer from. This is the guy that comes into the town and says, Oh, yeah, and this happened a few years ago when I was pastoring. They, they did Oklahoma. Somebody came in with some money and he said, Look, I'm going to supply, I'm gonna supply what you need. I'm going to supply a costume. I'm going to supply I'm gonna supply an orchestra. I'm going to supply music. I'm going to supply a makeup. I'm going to supply tickets. You just practice and work on this. I'm going to supply all that. That's the word there. By the way, I was a tree in scene three at Oklahoma. Remember that? One of my best moments. For this very reason now, because of God's salvation, applying all diligence, in your faith, supply moral excellence. That has the, the word moral excellence has the idea of courage. Courage to be strengthened and to stand with courage for the truth. Well, why would we have the truth in God's word? In the moral excellence, supply knowledge. That's epigenosco. That's not just the facts. It's taking the facts, letting it work into our heart, and then letting the Spirit of God change us. It's more than just facts. It's applying facts. Then to your moral, then to your knowledge, supply self-control. Self-control is just 
controlling yourself. The power of the Holy Spirit. Chuck Swindoll said, it's getting a grip on oneself. If we can understand the Spirit of God filling us to give us self-control, we, we may struggle with addiction. That's a, that's a title. That's a victim's title. We, we, we won't be able to come by because we have the power of God in us. And in your self-control, supply perseverance. Two words, hupo mone. Hupo means to remain. Uh, hupo means to be under. And mone means to remain. When you're going through a difficult time, we stick to it. That's another proof that we're truly a believer. We don't get bitter at God. We don't hate God. We go through that. We realize that everything that happens to us is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We realize it and we persevere. Then we add to our perseverance, God. That is a great New Testament word. It's a reverence. It's an awe of God. It's, it's, it's this whole, the whole 45, 50 minutes of music beforehand just put us in a framework of an awe of God. That's what he is, and that's who abides in us through the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, we start acting like God. Then to our godliness, supply brotherly kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is, is goodness, but this knocks goodness up another step. It's, it's active goodness, brotherly kindness. When I got out of the hospital in April, I still had some tubes in me, and we just got out of the car, and I was shaking like a 95-year-old man. And, and, and all of a sudden, as we were going to the door, we saw wasps flying around, and I called on the deacons, and, and his brotherly kindness came over, and I took care of those things. To brotherly kindness, love. Not eros, not erotic love. Not filial love, not friendship love, like we have for one another here. Not story game love, not family love, not agape love. A self-sacrificing love that loves even when someone doesn't deserve it like God loved us and when we were sinners and died for our sins. Would you continue on in this passage? For if these qualities are not yours, these seven virtues are not yours, and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. In the true knowledge, if these seven things are increasing, we will not be useless and unfruitful in the body of Christ and in the service of God, in the true knowledge of our Lord and Savior. That's passion. However, he lacks these seven virtues. It's blind and short-sighted. You can't, you can't see ahead of you. That's why you're, you're always griping, you're always complaining, you're always complaining when the message is real long and it's hot. <laughs> Nothing satisfies you. Christ doesn't satisfy because you're not adding these things to your life. When we came here to Kennedy, we came on a Friday night to talk to the pastoral search committee. We met in the youth room. We met for three hours. By the time we got out to the car, fog city. Fog city. People told me. Everyone at Hazel told me. Morris told me. Kill told me. When you pull out, take the first right, take the second right, take the third right, and back on route one. I get in my car, I pull up, and I go past the YMCA, and I keep going that way. And it was sad, it was Sunday morning at 8 before we got out of the fog. <laughs> I was short sighted, I couldn't see. That's what happens if we're not adding these things to our life, but we don't have the passion about it. If you have a passion for salvation, the Spirit of God, be a slave of Christ, to be set apart for God in sanctification. Fifthly, we'll just spend just a minute or two on this one. We need to have a passion. For the second coming of Christ. Did you drop down to verse number 16? Again, remember the context. False teaching going on. Notice what Peter said. We did not follow cleverly devised tales. That's what chapter 2 is all about. In fact, in chapter 3, he even, he, they, were, they were really coming out strong, criticizing the second coming of Christ. In 2 Peter 3, 4, they were saying, well, where is the, where is the promise of the coming? Not when is the promise of the coming, but where? He's not really coming again. He just, we did not follow the coming of the divided tale. When we made known to you, who's the you? Those who received the same thing as ours in verse number one. When we made known to you the power, do not allow dynamite, the explosive, dramatic second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of this. What is he talking about? We were eyewitnesses. Did, did Peter see the second coming? No, he saw a preview of it in Matthew 17 and in Luke chapter 7 in the transfiguration. He goes on to say, But when he, who's the he, the Lord Jesus, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. That's what Peter called God the Father. Majestic glory. He's, God, the Father said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. 
Jesus. And we're going to have a hard time understanding this. Because I, have, I, I was stressing out packing because I have so many clothes, so many shoes, like you. We have cars. We have homes here, homes outside of Canada, homes in Arizona, homes in... We, we've got... They lost everything for us. They lost their social status. They lost their friends. They lost their income. They lost their lives. They lost their homes. They needed the whole that despite the fact they were losing everything, they not only needed, needed to know that they were chosen by God and that God was preparing a place for them and for us and that he's coming back. Quick, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3. I just, this, this is the promise we're looking for. It's hard for us today because despite a little bit of persecution, we, we're, we're millionaires compared to other people, so we, we don't love this doctrine like we should. But these dear people who are struggling, look at verse 13. This should be our hope. But according to his promise, the promise of the second coming, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I cannot wait to go and be there. I am so sick of my flesh. I am so sick of letting God go because I walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. I am looking forward to the place where righteousness is always going to dwell. And because of that, since you look for these things, verse 14, you diligently come by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Now, how could we have a passion for these five things? Here's the last test. Going back to 2 Peter 1, we need to have a passion for Scripture. We need to have a passion for the Word of God. Look at verse number 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. So we have, what is that? Right now. And we've got it even better than they had. But with confidence, Peter said we have the prophetic Word made more sure. What we have in the at this time, the Old Testament, maybe a few of the New Testament letters. At this time, he was saying that the Old Testament was, was was something much more accurate than visions and dreams and all these stories we're hearing up today. We have the prophetic word made more sure to which Moses says, you do well. That's a common way of saying you want to do this. He's not hammering at it. He's not beating the whole head. This is what we ought to do. We would do well to pay attention. The whole is in our close proximity. Ezra in Psalm 119 says, Your word I have treasured in my heart. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not, what? Sin against you. He said, we have a prophetic word more sure to which we do well to pay attention as a lamp shines with metaphor. A lamp illuminates. A lamp gives light. The lamp that he's talking about here again is the Old Testament, which in the New Testament, they always use the word scripture, as we will see in the next verse. To which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in, notice this, in a dark place. Place, topa, a specific area, a specific location. The dark place is planet Earth right now where righteousness is not known. And that's why Chestnut Street Baptist Church and Merrimack Community Church needs to be a, 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 a light for God. Wanting to be set apart for God. Not to be weird, but set apart for Him so that He can use us to build, use us to build His kingdom. We are to do this until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. That's another way of saying we need to be diligent until the second coming, the appearance of Christ Jesus. And in Revelation 22, 17, He said, Behold, and thinking of the white, the white covering over that. It's a great New Testament word. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Good work for that. And beloved, we don't have just the Old Testament and a few of the New Testament words. We have the complete canon of Scripture, 66 books. And we ought to do it not only for the Lord's sake, not for the sake of Justice Street Baptist Church, but our own heart. Our heart, that's why it's all going to say, guard your heart with great diligence. We're out of the heart, out of the inner man, out of the inner self, out of the real you and I, flows the issues of life. We, if we don't have a passion for the five, we need to have a passion for Scripture. And it's interesting because the word passion has a passive side about it. Passion speaks of action, but there's a passive side to it. In other words, what am I going to elect? What am I going to let affect me so that I can do these other five? The TV people know this. The commercials, they, they advertise to get us to have things that we don't need to get us to death for stuff that's going to break. 
What's driving us? What's going to drive us from these five points is Scripture. A passion for God's Word. Look at verse 20. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, one's own spin. I'm telling you folks, I'm not that clever. I could not come up with this on my own. I took the Word of God in the original languages, looked them up, and th this is not just my spin, and that's what Peter's saying. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Why? For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. If we were in charge of the Bible, we would say, hey, let's just wait a minute. Three nine books of the Old Testament, too long, too boring, God is too mean. Let's go from 39 books to the Bible, rather. And the New Testament, the four Gospels, let's just have one, let's reduce it, reduce it. Let's take out hell. We, don't, we want to go on a law block. We would edit it. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will that men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And we are to love it. We are to search it. Beloved, please give Pastor Adam time for study or as you give him time, hold him accountable. You, I have Monday, Tuesday is my study day, and if you guys help me accountable too, but give him time. Call the deacons first. If it's an emergency, he'll come to you. But give him time to get along with God. So his passion for God will come out and it will be genuine because you know he's been with God. And a passion for God will move us in these other five things. And then after you all grow old and crotchety, the next generation will come along spiritually. Why? Because you've had a high view of God. And yes, worship involves hymns and choruses and candles and reciting and memorizing. But worship is responding to truth and truth is the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit's take on it here in verse number 21. But men were carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Let me read you what Jesus said. John chapter 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will disclose myself to him. It all comes to a heartfelt obedience. Oh, not to say it stays in we do this out of gratitude because as we look at the around the world, nothing offers us the greatness and goodness that God offers us in Christ. Same chapter, verse number 23, Jesus answered the question and said, anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him, you and I, and we will come to the make our abode with him. Acts chapter, well, I'll say that to my very, very last. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, my favorite passage in the Old Testament. They were, this is a preview of the future eschatology. And the Lord speaks. He says, Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? Because my hand made all these things, thus all things came into being. But to this one I will look. To this one I will regard. To this one I will abide. To this one I will bless. One who is humble and come by the Spirit, and one who trembles at my word. Are you like Simon Peter? Man, I want to be. I want to be like him because he had his passion for salvation, for the Spirit of God. He had a passion to be a slave of Christ. He had a passion to be set apart by God. He had a passion for the second coming. And yet, as the scripture, we have so much more than we do in the church, and we're not doing what they do. We're not setting the world upside down. They see us fight and feud. They don't see us filled with the Spirit. They don't see us encourage one another in our spirits. They just see us fighting and feud. I'm telling you, you will fall in love through, through the truth of God and practice these six things. And you will have a church, and you will have a church in Pontiac that will be the spiritual legacy for the little ones who are sitting in here. Again, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Let me tell you, I fought like crazy. I want to speak on the Lord. You see that put these words into my heart. I want to close with one last verse. The Apostle Paul, when he was saying goodbye to the church at Ephesus, he was saying goodbye to the elders he called together. And this is my prayer to you. Peter said, Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace 
which is able to build us up for a passion for salvation for the Spirit of God, to be a slave of Christ, to be set apart for God for the second coming, to build you up and to give us an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And if I don't see you ever again on planet Earth, I long to see you again in heaven. God bless you. And then you tell us of Jesus Christ, your own son who became one of us and lived that perfect life and then died innocently in our place. And you raised him back to life to prove that everything that he said is true. And we understand our salvation and our redemption. And we are humbled. We are humbled that, that Christ would do that for us. And then we are grateful. And as God said to Isaiah, who will go for me? And we respond. We respond by serving you in gratitude and love. 2,000 years ago, you sent your son into this world after having promised that event for thousands of years previous. 200 years ago, you set this church, this body of believers in this community. You moved in the hearts of people to establish this organized group of people who believe in Jesus Christ. And now we have been challenged to, in a new way, live out our passion, our gratitude. You've been faithful. You've sustained the witness of this 
church, in this community. You have been faithful to provide pastors and leaders. You have been faithful to, to provide workers. You have been faithful to provide funds. And again, all we can say is thank you. And then respond by working for you. We ask you, Lord, to, to continue to fulfill your promises until Christ returns. To provide when your people rely on you. To, to, to really continue to make known your love for humanity. To continue to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Father, I ask that you provide the leaders of Chestnut Street Baptist Church with Christ's wisdom and with Christ's humility. And I ask that so, so that they will have the power of your Holy Spirit. They will have the passion that we have heard spoken of today. That they will encourage and challenge your people to greater service of love for you. And Father, I pray for the people of Chestnut Street Baptist Church that they will have a new vision for the future. That, that they will have a, a new heart of love and commitment, a, a heart of passion to continue to, to serve Jesus Christ in this community, that, to serve him through, through loving deeds, through gracious witness. And I pray specifically, Lord, that many, many, many of them would become like Tilton Crabtree. And now, may the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and with one